Fort Sumter is one of 30 masonry forts. Fort Sumter was built to defend Charleston Harbor. Uh, after that, the United States government realized how weak the uh, national defenses were. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers comes in about 1828, surveys the area, and in 1829 they start to actually build the fort. And the fort would never be completed. 600 uh, scars on the exterior walls of the fort that had done some damage. And Fort Sumter uh, was surrendered officially on April 14, 1861. The year is 1861. America is falling apart at the seams. It's the second week in April. Seven states have already seceded from the Union. December 20th, 1860, South Carolina secedes, followed by Mississippi on January 9th, 1861, Florida, January 10th, Alabama, January 11th, Georgia, January 19th, Louisiana, January 26th, and Texas, February 1st. No blood has been spilled yet, but tensions are high. On February 7th, the seven states that have already seceded from the Union adopted a provisional constitution for the Confederate States of America. A temporary capital was established in Montgomery, Alabama. As states began seceding, they started to seize federal property within their boundaries. Weapon arsenals, forts, camps, fortifications, and buildings within the newly formed Confederacy that were formerly run by the Union. President James Buchanan protested these actions in the South, but he did nothing to stop them. Buchanan was concerned that any military action he might take against the states in secession might cause the remaining slave states to secede as well. He believed that there was no constitutional authority for a state to secede, but he could find no constitutional authority to prevent them from doing so. He was in a bit of a pickle, to say the least. But his time as president was coming to an end, and Abraham Lincoln had been elected, and he would be inaugurated on March 4, 1861. There were a number of forts in Charleston's harbor. Some were seized by the Confederates, but Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie had not yet been taken over. Fort Moultrie had been used since 1776. It was the headquarters of the U.S. Army Garrison. The fort had been set up for defending the harbor, and it did not have very many defenses against land-based attacks. Newspapers wrote that the sand dunes had piled up against the walls in such a way that the wall could easily be scaled. The garrison at Fort Moultrie began clearing away the sand dunes, and Charleston objected. Major Robert Anderson of the 1st U.S. Artillery Regiment was in charge of the Charleston Garrison. He was a Kentucky native and a prodigy of General Winfield Scott, the General-in-Chief of the Army. Major Anderson replaced the previous commander, Colonel John L. Gardner, in the fall of 1860. The colonel was nearing retirement, and the Army thought that Major Anderson was more capable of handling the crisis in Charleston. Anderson had served an earlier tour at Fort Moultrie, and his father had defended the fort during the American Revolutionary War. During the fall of 1860, authorities in South Carolina believed secession to be inevitable. Tensions began to rise in the harbor, still controlled by the federal government. South Carolina placed picket ships to observe the movements of the garrison in the forts. When the U.S. arsenal in the city transferred 40 rifles to one of the forts in the harbor, South Carolina authorities threatened an attack. Fort Sumter and the entrance of Charleston Harbor was not yet finished. When construction ended, it was to be one of the strongest fortresses in the world. In 1860, the fort was almost completed. One soldier was garrisoned at the fort. His role was to be a lighthouse keeper. There was also a number of civilians doing construction on the fort. Six days after South Carolina seceded from the Union on December 26, Major Robert Anderson abandoned Fort Moultrie. The fort was undefendable, so at nightfall he relocated his command in small boats to Fort Sumter. He ordered Fort Moultrie's guns spiked and his gun carriages burned. When South Carolina authorities found out that Anderson moved to Fort Sumter, they were very unhappy with him to say the least. Governor Francis Pickens thought that President Buchanan had promised to keep Fort Sumter unoccupied. President Buchanan had spoken with Pickens and promised that he would not immediately occupy it. Major Anderson believed he was just moving his garrison from one location to another. 
He received instructions from the War Department on December 11th, written by Major General Don Buell, Assistant Adjutant General of the Army, approved by Secretary of War John B. Floyd. It reads, You are to hold possession of the forts in the harbor, and if attacked, you are to defend yourself to the last extremity. The smallness of your force will not permit you, perhaps, to occupy more than one of three forts, but an attack on or attempt to take possession of any one of them will be regarded as an act of hostility, and you may put your command into either one of them, which you may deem most proper to increase its power of resistance. You are also authorized to take similar steps wherever you have tangible evidence of a design to proceed to a hostile attack. Governor Pickens ordered that all remaining federal positions except for Fort Sumter were to be seized. South Carolina troops occupied Fort Moultrie, capturing 56 guns in the process, Fort Johnson, and the battery on Morris Island. December 27, 1860, 150 men seized the Union-occupied Castle Piccany fortification located close to downtown in the harbor. 24 guns and mortars were seized. December 13th, the federal arsenal in Charleston was captured. The militia took more than 22,000 weapons from that arsenal. The Confederates repaired Fort Moultrie and installed dozens of new batteries and defensive positions in Charleston Harbor. They also built a floating battery on Charleston Harbor. They were all well equipped with arms captured from the federal arsenal. President Buchanan was confused at Anderson's choice to move to Fort Sumter. He was unaware that Anderson received any authorization. Governor Pickens demands the federal government evacuate Charleston Harbor. President Buchanan denied this. Supplies in Charleston Harbor were low. Buchanan authorized a relief expedition, including supplies, small arms, and 200 soldiers. A sloop of war, USS Brooklyn, was to be used, but the Federals found out that the Confederates had sunk ships which blocked the shipping channel into Charleston, and it was believed that the Brooklyn had too deep a draft to make it past the sunken ships. Instead, an unarmed merchant ship, the Star of the West, which Buchanan thought might be perceived as less provocative to the Confederates, was to be used. On January 9, 1861, the battery on Morris Island fired on the Star of the West. Batteries from Fort Moultrie joined in, and the Star of the West was forced to withdraw. Major Anderson prepared his guns when he heard the sounds of Confederate fire. He was unaware that a relief mission had been sent to him. He chose not to start an engagement with the Confederates. Governor Pickens wrote a letter to President Buchanan on January 31, 1861, saying that he wanted Fort Sumter to surrender. Because I regard that possession is not consistent with the dignity or safety of the state of South Carolina. Things were tough at Fort Sumter in the winter of 1860 to 1861. Rations were running low and fuel for heating was limited. The garrison worked to complete their defenses. Fort Sumter was designed to have 135 mounted guns operated by 650 men and officers. But the fort was only around 90% finished in 1861. Major Anderson's garrison was made up of 85 men. Two artillery companies. Company E, 1st U.S. Artillery, commanded by Captain Doubleday, and Company H, commanded by Captain Seymour. There were six other officers present. The surgeon, Samuel Crawford, 1st Lieutenant Theodore Talbot of Company H, 1st Lieutenant Jefferson C. Davis of the 1st U.S. Artillery, and 2nd Lieutenant Norman J. Hall of Company H, Captain John Foster, and 1st Lieutenant George Snyder of the Corps of Engineers, who were responsible for the construction of Charleston Forts. They reported to their own headquarters in Washington. The remaining soldiers were 68 non-commissioned officers and privates, 8 musicians, and 43 non-combative workmen. The garrison had positioned 60 guns by April, but they did not have enough men to operate them. The fort had three levels of enclosed gun positions known as casemates. The second level was unoccupied. Most of the guns were on the first level, the parapet, and the parade field. The original purpose of the fort was of harbor defenses. Unfortunately, most of the guns were aimed at the Atlantic Ocean. The fort had little defenses 
for being bombarded from the surrounding land or from infantry conducting an assault. Brigadier General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard took control of South Carolina forces in Charleston on March 1st. He was appointed by President Jefferson Davis as the first general officer in the armed forces of the new Confederacy. Beauregard demanded that Union forces either surrender or withdraw. He made sure that no supplies from the city would reach Fort Sumter. He knew supplies were running low. He increased training to the South Carolina militia. He trained them to operate the guns. Ironically, Major Anderson had been Beauregard's artillery instructor at West Point. The two had been very close. Beauregard had become Anderson's assistant after he graduated. In March, Beauregard began drilling his troops, Anderson as well, and making improvements on his fortifications. Beauregard was a trained military engineer. He'd been building up an overwhelming number of guns to challenge Fort Sumter. Fort Moultrie had three 8-inch Columbiads, two 8-inch howitzers, five 32-pound smoothbores, and four 24-pounders. Outside Fort Moultrie were five 10-inch mortars, two 32-pounders, two 24-pounders, and a 9-inch Dahlgren smoothbore. The floating battery had one 24-pounder and four 10-inch mortars. Fort Johnson had one 24-pounder and four 10-inch mortars. On Morris Island, the Confederates had seven 10-inch mortars, two 42-pounders, one English Blakely rifled cannon, and three 8-inch Columbiads. Beauregard had 6,000 men to man the artillery and assault the fort if necessary. On March 4, 1861, Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as president. Just a few days later, he was informed that Major Anderson had only six weeks of rations left at Fort Sumter. A similar crisis was happening at Pensacola, Florida, and Fort Pickens, where the Confederates were threatening the fort. Lincoln did not know how to reinforce the forts, or even if he should. He was concerned whether these actions might start hostilities. He was concerned about being seen as the aggressor. The Confederate government had similar talks about the situation. After the Confederate States of America was formed, debates started about whether the capture of the fort was a matter for South Carolina or for the Confederate government. Governor Pickens believed that all property in Charleston Harbor had reverted to South Carolina upon the state's secession as an independent commonwealth. Other debates occurred about how aggressively they should act in order to gain Fort Sumter and Fort Pickens. President Davis, just like President Lincoln, did not want to be seen as the aggressor. Both sides believed the first to use force would lose political support in the border states. Before Lincoln was inaugurated, five states voted against secession, including Virginia. Lincoln offered to surrender Fort Sumter if it would guarantee Virginia's loyalty to the Union. When confronted about this, Lincoln said, A state for a fort is no bad business. The Confederates sent delegations to Washington, D.C. They offered to pay for federal properties and enter into a peace treaty with the United States. Lincoln rejected this because he did not consider the Confederacy a legitimate nation and making a treaty would be tantamount to recognition of it as a sovereign government. Secretary of State William Seward engaged in negotiations. He wanted to give up Fort Sumter for political reasons, but negotiations failed. On April 4th, the situation at Fort Sumter was drastic. They were dangerously low on supplies. President Lincoln ordered a relief expedition. It was to be commanded by a former naval captain, Gustav Fox. He proposed a plan for a nighttime landing, using smaller vessels than the Star of the West had been. Fox was ordered to land at Fort Sumter with only supplies, but if he was confronted by Confederates, to respond with U.S. Navy vessels following, and then land both supplies and men. Major Anderson was notified, although the date was not revealed to him. President Lincoln notified Governor Pickens that an attempt will be made to supply Fort Sumter with only provisions and that if such attempt not be resisted, no effort to throw in men, arms, or ammunition will be made without further notice except in case of an attack on the fort. Lincoln did not notify the Confederate government 
he had only notified the governor of South Carolina. Lincoln did not recognize the Confederacy. Governor Pickens informed General Beauregard. President Davis ordered Beauregard to repeat the demand for Fort Sumter's surrender, and if it did not, to reduce the fort before the relief expedition arrived. The Confederates held a cabinet meeting and agreed with President Davis's order on April 9th. The only person to oppose was Secretary of State Robert Toombs. He told Jefferson Davis, The attack will lose us every friend in the North. You will only strike a hornet's nest. Legions, now quiet, will swarm out and sting us to death. It is unnecessary. It puts us in the wrong. It is fatal. Beauregard dispatched his aides, Colonel James Chestnut, Colonel James Chisholm, and Captain Stephen Lee to Fort Sumter on April 11th to issue the ultimatum. Anderson refused. It is reported that he said, I shall await the first shot, and if you do not batter us to pieces, we shall be starved out in a few days. The aides returned to Charleston and reported to Beauregard at 1 a.m. on April 12th. The aides returned to Fort Sumter, bringing Anderson a message from Beauregard. If you will state the time which you will evacuate Fort Sumter and agree in the meantime that you will not use your guns against us unless ours shall be employed against Fort Sumter, we will abstain from opening fire upon you. Major Anderson consulted with his senior officers. He replied to Beauregard that he would evacuate Fort Sumter by noon on April 15th unless he received new orders from his government or additional supplies. Colonel Chestnut wrote a reply. He handed it to Anderson at 3.20 a.m. Sir, by authority of Brigadier General Beauregard, commanding the provisional forces of the Confederate States. We have the honor to notify you that he will open fire of his batteries on Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. Anderson escorted the Confederate officers back to their boat. He shook each of their hands and said, If we never meet in this world again, God grant that we may meet in the next. At 4.30 a.m. in the morning of April 12, 1861, Lieutenant Henry Farley, commanded by Captain George James, fired one 10-inch mortar round from Fort Johnson. It is said that Captain James offered Roger Pryor, a Virginia Sessionist, the chance to fire the first shot, but he declined, saying, I could not fire the first gun of the war. The mortar exploded over Fort Sumter. This was a signal to open the general bombardment. There were 43 guns and mortars at Fort Moultrie, Fort Johnson, the floating battery, and Cummins Point. Beauregard ordered the guns fired in a counterclockwise motion around the harbor with two minutes between each shot. The order was to conserve ammunition. He calculated he had only 48 hours of ammunition. Edmund Ruffin, who was another Virginia secessionist, had traveled to Charleston in order to be present for the first shots of the war. He fired one of the first shots after the signal round of a 64-pound shell from the iron battery at Cummins Point. The shelling from the batteries woke all of Charleston civilians. They witnessed the shells fly over the water and burst over the fort. Major Anderson did not fire at first. He wanted to wait till daylight. His troops reported at 6 a.m. they had breakfast, and then at 7 a.m. Captain Doubleday fired a shot at the ironclad battery at Cummins Point, but he missed. Due to Anderson's lack of manpower, he could not fire all of his 60 guns. Anderson avoided using guns that were inside the fort, where casualties would be most likely. The fort had its best cannons mounted on its third tier. Unfortunately, this is where his troops would be most exposed to oncoming fire. The fort was designed to withstand a naval assault, and Navy warships did not have guns capable of elevating high enough to shoot over the walls of the fort. But land-mounted cannons could fire in a high arch that would reach nearly all parts of the fort. Anderson's troops could only safely fire from 21 guns on the lowest level, but these were limited due to their gun holes, incapable of firing high enough to threaten Fort Moultrie. Even though Anderson's troops moved most of the supplies from Fort Moultrie when they moved to Fort Sumter, they were low on ammunition. 34 hours into the bombardment, they were nearly out, 
An even bigger problem was the lack of cloth gunpowder cartridges. Only 700 were available at the beginning of the battle. Some of the workers made some out of socks in order to create more. Some even from Major Anderson's personal wardrobe. Because of these limitations, Anderson ordered firing from only six guns. Two aimed at Cummins Point, two at Fort Moultrie, and two at the Sullivan's Island Battery. The relief ships sent by President Lincoln began to arrive on April 12th. Fox himself arrived at 3 a.m., but most of his fleet was delayed until 6 p.m. As the small boats were sent towards the fort with supplies, the fire from artillery deterred them. They pulled back. Fox made the decision to wait until nightfall and for the arrival of the warships. Heavy seas made it difficult to load the small boats the next day. Fox hoped Anderson could hold out until dark on the 13th. Fort Sumter was a masonry fort, but it had wooden buildings on the inside, used for barracks and for officers' quarters. The Confederates used this to their advantage. They heated cannonballs in a furnace and then fired these at the wooden buildings. The fire started by the cannonballs would be more dangerous to the men than the exploding artillery shells. Luckily for Union defenders, a rain shower passed over at 7 p.m. on April 12th, extinguishing the fires set by the heated shot. The Union stopped firing for the night. The men were uneasy that night, concerned about the potential infantry assault. The Confederates reduced firing to four shots each hour. The following morning, the full bombardment started again, and the Confederates again fired heated shots towards the wooden buildings. By midday, almost all of the buildings and the main gate were on fire. The fire continued to burn and made its way towards the main ammunition magazine. 300 barrels of gunpowder was being stored there. The garrison frantically tried to move the barrels to a safe location. They safely relocated a third of the barrels of gunpowder, but Anderson ordered them to stop. It was too dangerous and he ordered them to close the magazine doors and he ordered the remainder of the barrels thrown into the sea. The tide kept floating the barrels back onto the shore in groups. Some of the barrels were ignited, being hit by artillery rounds. Anderson ordered his gun crews to continue firing and double their efforts. The Confederates did the same, firing even more hot shots. It is said that many of the Confederates admired the courage and determination of the Union soldiers. When the fort had to stop firing, the Confederates cheered and applauded, sometimes shouting at the nearby Union ships for failing to come to the fort's aid. At around 1 p.m. on April 13th, the fort's flagpole was knocked down. Colonel Lewis Wigfall, a former senator, had been observing the battle. He figured this was an indication that the fort had had enough. He commandeered a small boat from Morris Island and headed to Fort Sumter waving a white handkerchief from his sword and dodging incoming rounds from Sullivan's Island. He met with Major Anderson and told him, You have defended your flag nobly, sir. You have done all that is possible to do, and General Beauregard wants to stop this fight. On what terms, Major Anderson, will you evacuate this fort? Anderson was happy that Wigfall said evacuate and not surrender. Anderson was dangerously low on ammunition. There were fires burning out of control. His men were hungry and exhausted. He was satisfied that he defended his post with honor. He had endured over 3,000 Confederate rounds without losing a single man. Major Anderson agreed to a truce at 2 p.m. on April 13, 1861. Anderson had Wigfall's white handkerchief raised on the flagpole. Wigfall had left and headed back to Morris Island. A delegation of officers representing General Beauregard spotted the white handkerchief. Stephen Lee, Portia Miles, and Roger Pryor sailed to Fort Sumter. They were unaware of Wigfall's visit to the fort. Major Anderson was outraged when these officers disavowed Wigfall's authority. They told him the former senator had not spoken with Beauregard for two days and he threatened to resume firing. Finally, General Beauregard spotted the white handkerchief himself and sent a second set of officers who were offering essentially the same terms that Wigfall had offered. The agreement was reinstated.
the Union garrison at Fort Sumter formally surrendered to Confederate personnel at 2.30 p.m. on April 13th. No one from either side was killed during the bombardment. Anderson had one condition for withdrawal, a 100 gun salute to the U.S. flag. During the 100 gun salute, a pile of cartridges blew up from a spark, mortally wounding Private Donald Hugh and Edward Galloway and seriously wounding the four other members of the gun crew. These were the first military fatalities of the war. The salute was stopped at 50 shots. Hugh was buried in the Fort Sumter parade ground. Two hours after the explosion, Galloway and Private Fielding were sent to hospital in Charleston, where Galloway died a few days later. Fielding was released after six weeks. The other wounded men, along with the remaining Union troops, were put on Confederate steamer named the Isabel. They spent the night and were transported the next morning to Fox's relief ship, the Baltic. On April 18th, Major Anderson sent a telegram to Washington. It reads, Sir, having defended Fort Sumter for 34 hours until the quarters were entirely burned, the main gates destroyed by fire, the gorge wall seriously injured, the magazine surrounded by flames, and its doors closed from the effects of the heat, four barrels and three cartridges of powder being only available and no provisions but pork remaining. I accepted terms of evacuation offered by General Beauregard, being the same offered by him on the 11th prior to the commencement of hostilities, and marched out of the fort Sunday afternoon, the 14th with colors flying and drums beating, bringing away company and private property and saluting my flag with 50 guns. Robert Anderson, Major, 1st Artillery. The bombardment of Fort Sumter was the first military action of the Civil War. After the surrender, Northerners rallied behind Lincoln's call for all states to send troops to recapture the forts and preserve the Union. Lincoln called for 75,000 men for 90 days. The call for 75,000 troops triggered four additional slave states to declare secession from the Union and join the Confederacy. A few attempts were made to capture Charleston Harbor during the war but it remained in Confederate hands for almost the entire four-year duration of the war. And that is the Battle of Fort Sumter. I hope you all enjoyed. I had a blast making this video. I always learn a lot, and I hope you did too. And we will see you on the next. Peace.